were going to be discussing a good man is hard to find. Anybody have the feeling, get the sensation, the feeling that this is a true Catholic writer? Huh? You did? Especially toward the end. Okay, well, she, Flannery O'Connor is known for her story, so she wrote two novels. Uh, Wise Blood, which is about a young man who's kind of a, an evangelist, uh, making fun of traditional religion, I think. And then uh, The Violent Bear It Away has another young person, even a younger person, who's very, very odd and gets involved with uh, kind of trying to carry the message into the world also. She also has two books of essays. One, Mystery and Manners is the one you might want to read if you're uh, interested in what she's doing. Uh, but if you're interested in literature or writing, you should especially get The Habit of Being. The Habit of Being. It's such a good book. I made a, a workshop that I held on the novel. They all had to read it. And they were from, this was in a public university, state university. So they were all from all kinds of backgrounds, but they all did read it and they all learned from it. Uh, it's the best single book, I believe, on writing. And it's also the best single book, especially if you're a Catholic and a Catholic writer. It's based on a series of letters to Robert Fitzgerald, who was a Catholic uh, poet and translator of Greek poetry, and his wife, Sally Fitzgerald. And she wrote, in an introduction to The Habit of Being, she wrote, I've come to think that the true likeness of Flannery O'Connor will be painted by herself, a self-portrait in words to be found in her letters. And this Habit of Being is a collection of her letters to the Fitzgerald. There she stands, a phoenix risen from her own words, calm, slow, funny, Courteous, both modest and very sure of herself, intense, sharply penetrating, uh, devout, but never pietistic, downright, occasionally fierce, and honest in a way that restores honor to that word. So that's a pretty laudatory introduction. That's only a part of it. So O'Connor was born in Mill Edgeville, Mill Edgeville, Georgia, 1925. Uh, she went to a state college there in the State College of Georgia in Milledgeville, Georgia. And uh, she wrote for the campus publication. Uh, her stories then were sent or she used them to apply to the University of Iowa and Iowa City. And uh, she was granted a fellowship to the Writers Workshop in Iowa City. This was the premier workshop in the U.S. at the time, uh, started in the 1940s, actually was started as a kind of a, a place for, for, for people who were on the GI Bill, but didn't necessarily want to take real, real academic courses. They could take the writer's workshop and, and many of them became creative writers and published novels and so forth. So it was a good setup and that's what it was set up for and it became the, because it was started the earliest to have a writer's workshop. The second uh, one was the University of Illinois that I attended, which started just a few years later. So we had uh, writer's workshops there too. But that was a place to go, Iowa City, if you wanted to, to learn to write. And uh, anyway, from the 40s and perhaps into the 1970s, and then it became... Uh, also, uh, sadly politicized, that is, agents and editors and publishers descend on the campus twice a year and try to pick out the, the rising star among the writers, the one they're going to publish or represent. So it, it gets real sticky. I, I judged their short story contest one year, and that's about the time all the agents and the rest were coming in, and this was in the about 1976, I guess. And it was it was not a pleasant place to be, because if you're if you're left out, you're that's it. Forget about your wildest dreams; they're going to take these two. You're a reject. And that it was never that way before. It's just set up for for writers. All right. Uh, so, O'Connor's 
father died in 1941 of lupus. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a one of the worst diseases because it it, it, it attacks the very center of what keeps you from having d- diseases, that is the immune system. And when she was 25, it was discovered she had lupus also. So she went back to Mill Edgeville and, and lived on the family. It was a dairy farm, 550 acres. Uh, might find sounds small to those of us who live in the high plains where thousands of acres are kind of necessary. Uh, but for instance, in, da- in dairy farms in Wisconsin could be 60, 70 acres. And they'd be milking 20, 30 cows just because there's more grass. Uh, and and better, better feed. Anyway, so she goes back home and and then spent three hours every morning, nine to twelve, writing. That was it. And pretty much any writer will tell you three to four hours is the, the maximum creative time any writer has. You got to quit then. You're going to start ruining yourself. So that's a good idea to carry into your own writing too. If you're working on an essay, draft in one sitting, then forget about it. Let it go for a day or two. And then sit down and work on it for three hours and then let it go. Forget about it. Because you can spend too much time, you get worn out, your judgment is not that good. So for the rest of the day, she would write letters, uh, answer letters, write letters to the Fitzgeralds, and work on essays and things like that. Now, though she had lupus, she didn't, she didn't uh, isolate herself. She gave as many public talks at colleges and universities as she could, as her health allowed. And a lot of those are collected in Mystery and Manners, a great book, one of my favorite books of essays. Uh, and my favorite book about writing is The Habit of Being. However, I have to confess uh, that uh, I, I'm ambivalent about her fiction. She, she worked hard at it and uh, it's engaging. Uh, she she uh, received the National Book Award in 1972. This is about 10 years after she died. She died when she's only 39. Uh, and I think, let's see, I think it was this six, must have been the 60, 62, wasn't it? Uh, Anyway, uh, she was 39 when she died, and in in 1972, she received the National Book Award for her stories which were collected. She was no longer living. One of the arguments, uh, actually I was served in that committee, uh, the National Book Award Committee. One of the arguments was, you don't uh, don't give an award to a writer who's no longer living. I mean, does that have anything to do with quality? No. So, so I argued well, it has to do with quality. So anyway, she received that, that National Book Award, 31 stories in, in the collected stories, which were, many of which collected after she, after her death, of course. So I spent a lot of time talking about her because she's the only, let's call it undisputed Catholic writer that we've looked at this whole semester, unless possibly Shakespeare, but you never can tell. I mean, you just don't know about him. He's kind of a slippery fellow. But she was clearly that, a devout Catholic, uh, went to Mass every, probably sometimes every day when she could, when she was around a church where she could, uh, and talked explicitly about her Catholicism to the Fitzgeralds in her letters to them. But as I said, I'm ambivalent about her fiction uh, because uh, the violence she often packs into it, as you see in this story. Let's see, I guess six people are shot, that is killed, in this particular story. Uh, So... She has said, I'm just quoting this loosely, in a violent world, uh, the writer has to be even more violent to, you know, reach the reader. Now, I don't, I'm not sure how you square that with Christianity, where uh, even if you're, you know, you're s- slapped in the face, uh, you're supposed to take it. That's, that's, by the way, is a personal injury. It has nothing to do with a government or, 
or any larger uh, entity, though some people use that to say, you know, there shouldn't be any wars or that sort of thing. That's not true. It's about a personal private injury you slap in the face. So if you're not supposed to respond to that or you're supposed to turn the other cheek, as it says, uh, uh, do you turn the cheek to violence? So that's one of the difficulties I have with her with her fiction. Uh, I believe that you can convey what she wants to say without being that violent. I don't know. Uh, uh, another reason I kind of shy from her fiction or, you know, don't always get so involved in it or her as a writer, except in her essays or nonfiction, is that so many of her, of her supporters are those who like her fiction and support her fiction, uh, they're, they're well, well, not, not, it's not that they're so violent, but, but they're so unremittingly, uh, let's say positive, let's say about her and her fiction, that it's almost like a cult. And that, that's off putting to me also. So a good man is hard to find. This is the character. He's, he, he's the owner of the, the tower, it's called. Uh, a stucco and wood stop along the highway they're traveling. Uh, he's a guy with a paunch that hangs over his trousers like a sack of swaying meal. This is uh, Red Sammy is his name. Uh, And he's just a minor character. The 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 unruly or bad person in the in the story, you might even say the antagonist, is the grandmother, who's introduced in the very first sentence. The grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. By the way, that's a wonderful first sentence. You want to know who the grandmother is? What's this about? What's the trip to Florida? What what's going on here? About three or four things just by that simple, straightforward sentence, instead of trying to be fancy or flowery. So I love that sentence. So as it turns out, it's a family trip. It's a vacation, it seems. This would be far before the days of Disney World, where it seems now in America, if you don't take your children to Disney World, you're, a, you're a, an abusive parent, almost. <laughs> uh, I've never been there. I never took our children there. So. Oh. But I did go to Disneyland, I think it was the year, year or two after it opened. What I really remember about it is that they had these, this table of, with heat lamps above it. They had these curly chips in it. They called them Doritos. This, nobody had ever made uh, chips out of corn before. So this was their introduction to to the world, and if you liked it, then you're supposed to leave a note or something. And from then on, now everybody makes corn chips. That's about all I remember of Disneyland, which was in California. All right, so we also know it's a different world because everybody's reading the newspaper. They're not watching TV or on a much less on a smartphone. Uh, the Bailey, the father, she. Uh, it's in Bailey's house where grandma has parked herself. And so Bailey, the father, is reading the sports section. The kids are lying on the floor reading the funny papers, as they're called. That's the color section, you know, cartoons, uh, which was pretty common picture in America families back in the 50s. And uh, grandma's reading the news and shaking the paper at Bailey and telling him, Look, this misfit has escaped from prison and looks like he's traveling to Florida, too. So we shouldn't be going to Florida. She probably wants to go to Tennessee, it seems, which is where she's from, not Georgia. OK, so the children, uh, anyway, the old enough children is also a baby. Uh, John Wesley, he's named after the uh, founder of Methodism, the Methodist Church, Wesley. And June Starr. They're the two older children who are reading the funny papers. 
as it was called. And then uh, Grandma, who doesn't want to go, uh, sneaks into the family car before the trip uh, underneath the big black valise that looks like the head of a hippopotamus. What those are. Uh, a basket with newspaper over it, and under that is her cat. And she's not supposed to have a cat along because Bailey doesn't want to stop at a motel and they say, do you have any animals? And say, you got a cat, well, you can't stay here. Uh, so she's the first in the car, though she said she doesn't want to go to Florida. And she dresses up in, in case of an accident. Anybody have ever, ever hear of this? Uh, uh, in case of an accident, she, she t describes what she's wearing. In case of an accident, anyone seeing her dead on the highway would know at once that she was a lady. Now, this might sound... Now, we're coming from a different era now here because my grandmother used to say to me, always wear clean underwear, Larry, because you never know, you might be in a car accident and they'll come in now and dress you and think, ugh. <laughs> so, so this was a kind of a feeling back then. Wear your, wear your best in case of an accident. That's what uh, <coughs> Granny's up to here. Uh, so they stop at Red Sammy's for a meal. No, I'm not sure why this, this section is added. <laughs> Unless it's uh, to display uh, or opportunity to introduce the local Georgia folk who see who seem kind of misfits themselves. I mean, with that sack of cornmeal swing, swaying from his uh, above his trousers uh maybe maybe it's to display the family love for country music which they play on the machine and uh and the tap dad sing young dandy who's of course the star of the family june june star that's what happens there though there's a dialogue of course that happens also uh Here's, here's a here's a phrase I want to point out. She rolled her eyes and screwed up her mouth. How do you screw up your mouth? <laughs> you can screw it up if you get punched there, maybe, but that's a phrase that always bothered me. Like another one is her eyes dropped to the windowsill. Did, did she pick them up and put them back in? <laughs> You have to watch these descriptions when you're when you're writing fiction, or you're just going to might get just a laugh from the reader. There was a common phrase used back then: "You screwed up your mouth." Some people screwed up their eyes, also. However, you do that. Okay, so Red Sammy says that uh, some boys in a beat up old Chrysler stopped. They said they worked at the mill. This is probably a sawmill, and it's a kid considering it's Georgia. And he let them charge the gas that they took. Do you realize that, that this is probably an introduction of the boys and their car that looks like the trio that will later appear as the agents of death? You notice that, John? Do you notice that, Catherine? Maybe. Yeah. Well, now maybe. <laughs> I think so. I think that's why she has the scene. He wants to kind of slip that in there, uh, whether you recognize it or not, because that's what's going to be coming up later. So again, it's Grandma who has the bad advice. She she has wanted to go to Tennessee, and uh, I think it's I think it's the uh, John Wesley says. Uh, that that place is is just a hillbilly dumping ground Tennessee well there he's from Georgia mm -hmm. so we've we've seen red anyway so grandma suggests they take this back road the kids agree because she says she remembers that there's supposed to be silver behind a secret door and they want to see the secret door and Bailey says they they're not gonna let us even in the door if it's as people are living there 
But finally, since the kids raised such a ruckus and the John Wesley kick in the back of the seat and upsetting Bailey, his father, he decides, okay. And she said, well, it's about a mile back where we passed the road that I recognized to go to this place. So he turns around, they go back down this road. Uh, they're, they're driving down the road. When she realizes that the place that she's thinking of, which didn't have a secret panel with silver behind it anyway, she just made that up so they get the kids excited, uh, is in another state, a different physical state, like Tennessee, not where they are. And uh, she's so embarrassed at this that her, that her feet jump up and dislodge the valise, and the newspaper comes off, and the cat, his name is Pity Singh, jumps up and fastens itself on the back of Bailey's neck like a caterpillar the text says. So it's probably one of those brindle cats. Uh, and it, and so he screams and he runs, <laughs> runs into the ditch. This is, that part's kind of funny. And the car rolls. His wife gets flipped out with the baby. The uh, baby lives, but the wife breaks her shoulder, her arms dangling later. And uh, the two younger People, John and June, are in the back seat with Grandma, who's separating them for this drive. They're all bunged up a bit, but they're okay too. And uh, the kids get out and they say, "We've had an accident," and that's in put in bold type, so you know it's real loud that they're yelling this. Uh, then this dark car, like a hearse, comes down the road, and. Uh, the driver steps out. He's not even wearing a shirt. And there's another two with him, a trio of them then. Uh, they're all carrying pistols. So Grandma feels she knows the bespeckled driver. That fellow is not wearing a shirt. Bespeckled just means wearing glasses. And uh, of course, it's the misfit, whose picture she's seen in the newspaper he had to be introduced early on, or it seemed too surprising that he arrives just now. So first, he has his partners take Bailey and the boy John Wesley into the woods. They're in the woods there in this back road, and uh, take them off into the woods, and the readers hear two gunshots. Kind of can figure that one out. Uh, because they, none of them seem too kind or too bright, actually. So when the two return, they have with them uh, the, the shirt that Bailey was wearing. It has these bright peacocks on it, or, or parrots on it. I'm thinking of peacocks because Flannery O'Connor, when she was back on the farm, raised peacocks. So you always see her with, in pictures of her, she's often with peacocks. But the, uh, the guy has parrots, I think they're yellow, on his shirt. And uh, then they toss that shirt to the misfit and he puts it on. So it's as if he takes over the place of her son and will be talking to her through him, as it were. Uh, the dialogue between them doesn't seem to be always uh, the kind that would take place. Uh, let's see if I can find a particular spot here. It's an accent they cried. Uh, she says, uh, uh, she calls out for her son, Bailey boy. She called in a tragic voice, but found she was looking at the misfit. See, the transfer of the two uh, seems to occur. Uh, and she says, you're not a bit common. He says, no, I ain't a good man, uh, but I ain't the worst in the world neither. My daddy said I was a different breed of dog from my brothers and sisters. You know, daddy said it's some that can live their whole life without asking about it. And as others has to know why it is. And this boy is one of the ladders. He's going to be into everything. And, uh, it's kind of nice cracker talk.
and uh, she's good at that. She can do that in dialogue real well. And what's Grandma's response? Well, if you look further down the page there, you see, do you ever pray? What do you ever pray? Well, Annie says, I was a gospel singer for a while. I've been most everything. Been in the armed service, both land and sea, at home and abroad. Been twice married. Been an undertaker. Been in the railroads, plowed Mother Earth. Been in a tornado, seen a man burnt once alive. Alive once. And uh, he said, I even seen a woman flogged. Pray, pray, the grandmother began. Pray, pray. I don't know. Never was a bad boy, the misfit said. Not that I remember it. Uh, and then he, he, he's in the penitentiary and, uh, look up, it was a ceiling, look down, it was a floor. I forgot what I'd done, lady. I sat there, I sat there trying to remember what it was I'd done. And then he says, the head doctor at the penitentiary says, what I had done was kill my daddy. But I known it for a lie. And he says his daddy died of the epidemic. It wouldn't be quite the 1918 Spanish flu, it was called. It'd probably be uh, another ep epidemic. Many were, many occurred. Never was the whole world shut down. If you would pray, the old lady said, Jesus would help you. That's right, the misfit said. Well, then why don't you pray? She said, I don't want no help, he said. I'm doing all right by myself. That's pretty much the answer of, of all those who, who don't want to come to faith or don't believe in God or don't think there's such a thing as God or have never uh, experienced a relationship with Jesus and so on and so forth. And it's really a simple, it's a simple state or statement, yes or no. That's all it is. You either accept it or you don't. You can't force anybody into it. Uh, nobody's an expert on it because everybody's ex experience is different. But you can always come to the same person. That's that's what always occurs. Okay, so we, we know he probably killed his father. That's probably why he's called a misfit. Uh, and, he found, and he says, I found out that crime don't matter. You could do one thing or you can do another. Kill a man or take a tire off his car because sooner or later you're going to forget what it was you'd done and just be punished for it. So what he's saying in this is that there's no moral absolutes. Whether you kill somebody or take a tire off their car, it's the same thing. You're going to be blamed for it and you're going to suffer for it. So she keeps saying, well then why don't you pray and, and uh, come to Jesus and then she starts saying, Jesus, Jesus, meaning Jesus will help you. But the way she was saying it, it sounded as if she might be cursing. Jesus, Jesus. That's how she's saying it, I guess. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, then the mother, the baby, and June Star taken off and shot. And... The misfit uh, keeps talking to grandma. And he says, I call myself the misfit because I can't make what all I done wrong fit with what I gone through in punishment. He's, this is the kind of person who, you know, blames the outside events of the world itself for anything that happens to him. These are called victim, victims or people who victimize themselves. It's all the fault of so and so. It's all the fault of the world. I should never, this should never happen to me. And that way they can keep blaming other things and not realizing the responsibility is their own to make that choice or not make it. So he's stuck where he is. So, uh, so then uh, she, call, she keeps calling out for Bailey though she didn't seem to like him earlier much. And uh, and Jesus was the only one ever raised the dead, the misfit said. And he shouldn't have done it. He'd thrown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you 
to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you've got left the best you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness, he said. His voice had become almost a snarl. So if you have no moral sense, what's the difference? Uh, and finally, uh, she grabs up as if to hug him because he's like, he's like Bailey, her son, that she keeps calling out for. And uh, he shoots her three times in the chest. And uh, the others come back from their murdering they've done. And uh, one says she was a talker, wasn't she? This is Bobby Lee named there. And uh, the misfit said she would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. This is from a Catholic writer. I mean, this is what gets to me. Uh, some fun, <laughs> Bobby Lee said, shooting somebody every minute of their life, he means. And shut up, Bobby Lee, the misfit said, it's no real pleasure in life. He means, I have no real pleasure in life. What he means is, I only have pleasure in death. And what was he run by? Well, he's run by this fellow who said, Jesus said he was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. He's the father of lies and all lies come from him. And he murdered whoever he could, wherever he could get to. And the spiritual state of not having a savior is death. So that's in that sense, he murders people. When he lies, he speaks of his own character or he is the father of lies and all lies come from him. And I think that that's what O'Connor is trying to say here with, if you have no sense of morality or sense of uh, the truth of these things that have happened, then uh, all lies count. And they take over your life and one life is no better than the other. And life is no different from death. In fact, he chooses death at the end and has practiced it all along his life probably beginning it seems 